Okay, I I think we're we're good. So going through it says it says live here. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, th- I think we're good. Um, so we're going through Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's maxims and reflections. I'm joined by Kev here to as my wonderful co-host to try and help me bounce ideas off them. How are things, Kev? Good, good. It's been a, You've been listening to this on audiobook. Yeah, on an audible. Yeah. Um, and how have you found it? Um, well, I feel like I should have probably um read it. I feel like I probably would have got more out yeah. of it. Um, because it's just like one line or you know first, a couple of lines. First, yeah, I'll I'll ask you first what. You've read Faust from Goethe, haven't you? But I'm not sure what else you've read from him. Or like what's That's your thoughts on much, Goethe? I, 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 I've only read Faust part one and two. That's all. Yeah. Um, and what I, you, I really did I really did it? like uh, I really laid like uh, Faust Faust part one. Faust part two I found a little disorientating. It's interesting. Uh, I've got, I found this old um this old kind of copy of classical essays from a second-hand bookstore here and um i might try to go through it a bit uh, on the channel because one of them has i've been reading from it on the channel but i haven't been um giving it it's a credit but i might try and do an analysis of one of the essays because it goes through um it's basically talking about helen of troy's appearance in Faust part two but it kind of gives you a greater context and understanding of what Goethe is trying to do in Faust Part Two, because I just say it for people who don't know anything about it. Like Faust Part One is the Faustian tale where Mesopheles uh, gives him the, the pact with the devil, and it's kind of straightforward. The simple love affair where he wants to basically use his newfound powers simply to get Gretchen, uh, you know, the the local village girl. To be his, and that's kind of where the drama first part one, and then first part two. He's like in ancient Greece. It's more ethereal. In, yeah. He almost yeah. He loses temporal boundaries, and yeah. the play is kind of a. It's almost plot. like uh, yeah. It's almost like kind of you know choice is uh, Finnegan's Wake and Ulysses are Dubliners and you. Uh, it is. It's kind of like that, except what I think is basically. The further, the deeper you go into the pact, the less constrained you are. So you lose sort of all discipline. That's being kind on Goethe, um, in in that like saying that it was intentional for him to lose all all discipline. But I think, of course, fa- famously, he found it really difficult to write, and he only kind of he barely finished wrapped, it, right? He wrapped yeah. it up just before he died. There's like what it. I think definitely, if he knew, he, maybe he knew he was dying, and if he didn't know that he could have redrafted it you know what i mean it's a final draft but only because he knew he was on the way out so he had to finish it mm-hmm. so gonna go through some of the maxims and we can just bounce ideas off and see if Goethe is talking sense or if he's talking absolute rubbish so actually i'm gonna i have Goethe's the princeton essential Goethe here first so I'm going to bounce through some parts of Goethe's life because it's got uh, it's got a chronology table here between with his, his life his works his, the intellectual currents and the historical events so he was born 1749 um, and around then there was Buffon's Histoire Naturelle which I think is sort of a natural history because Goethe of course was quite interested in natural history as well as um, he was kind of like uh, the last Renaissance man. Yeah. Something. Yeah. He, he wrote treaties on morphology and stuff. So, six, 1749, born, um, like 1752, it says here, Franklin demonstrates lightning is electricity. He's still a kid. 1759, French army occupies Frankfurt, where he was. So, he would have been, uh, what, 10 years old then. Schiller's born around then. The same year, Voltaire writes Candide. Um, a year later, McPherson comes out with the fragments, uh, fragments of Oshin, um, you know, which were eventually mm-hmm. proved to be forgery, but of course had a big influence on Goethe and Napoleon. I think he may have com- commented on, on, on that himself I, I, as a. I'm he wanted sure, to believe I, them, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. 
I think he was taken by them. Yeah. Um, same year as that comes out, Russia and Austria briefly occupied Berlin. So there's always these sort of territorial wars with standing armies going on. Germany's not united. So it's kind of like he is seen as the German Shakespeare, but Shakespeare at least inhabited a cohesive England, whereas Goethe is not inhabiting really a cohesive idea of Germany. Um, yeah, 1762, Rousseau comes out with social contract. 1763, Goethe gets to visit a, a recital by Mozart. So it's this sort of environment. Finkelman uh, publishes the history of art of antiquity, which really gets Germany interested in um, yes. classical history again. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. He goes 1776, friendship with uh, Charlotte von Stein. 1774. Is that um? 1774 is the sufferings of young Werther, and that's kind of his breakthrough. Yeah. What were you gonna say? No, no, I was I was kind of going off on a tangent. Um, and I was gonna say it was that when he was in Italy, but I think it was later. Yeah, I think that comes later. So 1774 is his breakthrough with Sars Young Werther, which blows up and you have all the young men trying to imitate being him and trying to what they dress like Werther and there's a spate of suicides. Yeah, yeah. he's uh, Kurt Cobain, I think we said before. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of was. I mean, the, the rock star. There's a real moral panic in Germany about <laughs> what do we do with these young men? Um, and also 1774, interestingly enough, is when Louis Kahn's Louis XV of France dies. So the same year he comes out with Werther, it's the same year the, um, the penultimate, you know, King of France before the revolution dies. Um, and Louis XVI takes the throne, which I've been going through uh, Thomas Carlyle's revolution, French revolution on the channel. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, yes, yeah, no, definitely. It's a, it's a heavy feature on this channel. I, I've read the uh, the opening to um, the French Revolution, and uh, yeah, it opens with um, it opens with the death of Louis the Fifteenth. Yeah, he really paints a somber scene, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. How how the kind of like you can picture this a... um, d you know, dimly lit candle room and just this like stench of death around Louis the Fifteenth. Yeah, and also this like the. Uh, the, the state or the the rule uh, the ruling uh, body or whatever yeah yeah it's obviously the same time you get two years later declaration of independence in the u.s you get things are uh, building up and then in the early 70s 80s um a lot of those staple men of letters the 18th century die like uh voltaire goes away uh, samuel johnson dies diderot dies so it's a kind of like um, generational phasing, getting ready for Goethe almost. The last wave. Bye. 1786. Yeah. When does he... So 1786, he leaves for Rome via Verona and Venice, and then 1787 to Naples and Sicily. But he had left Weimar by then. Hmm. When did he move to launches? He's in Weimar as early as... 1775. So he spends about 10 years in Weimar before those Italian travels, in which we, I think we get, we get um, Roman yeah, elements. Do we the, also the, get the epigram? Yeah, the prince was like uh, very taken with the sorrows of young Bertha. Um, yeah, he wanted to be that, uh, the Enlightenment <laughs> prince. Yeah. Kind of in the mold of um, Frederick the Great in Prussia, the, well, what, the Duke of Weimar. Mm. Then he's, he's present at the Siege of Mainz in 1793 when French Revolution starts kicking off. Um, and around 1790... Does it say uh, what his role was there? Uh, I would need to read it again. I know he like witnessed events in the French Revolution, but I don't know... Because like, some, of, some, of uh, some of the sayings were, uh, I noticed were of um, kind of contrasting the civilian with the, the soldier. Just a, yeah. cu a couple... And, uh, well, he did. You see, I wonder if he did any. 
He, de- he definitely would have seen a lot of it firsthand, though, Even whether or not you were in the army or not. What we're seeing here is like Berlin's getting occupied. Frankfurt gets occupied. He was there at the siege of Mainz. So he's constantly witnessing that firsthand. And I think that in the maxims, it's kind of like you have to, if someone, if a sort of intellectual was to do sort of maxims like that involving the army today, it, it just wouldn't work because they would never have experienced anything. They would have been, you know, stuffed in a in a study for their whole lives. Um, whereas Goethe genuinely witnessed this firsthand. He would have seen soldiers' behaviors against how civilians reacted or like towns maybe trying to hold out against sieges and so on. Yeah. Traveled in Switzerland extensively. 1790s then. Uh, 1796, Schiller writes on native and sentimental poetry. Fichte <laughs> has the theory of science. That's the one I'm looking for. 1795 is Schiller's the on the aesthetic education of man, which I believe you've read. No, I haven't read it. I, I own it, but it's one. Um, you own it. Yeah, I, 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 I do I need to get that at some point. Yeah. Um, Hölderlin is producing stuff around this time as well. Napoleon goes takes further with them to Egypt, 1798. Mm. Uh, which is a strange one. Like, I can get really liking Goethe, but uh, why would... like Sarah's Young Werther is kind of like... is it probably his most basic work. Um, and taken on a campaign to Egypt, I just find that really weird. Well, he did take a lot to Egypt. He took like a hundred scientists. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, he had a whole... Tr- so, tr- yeah, yeah he, had, he had a whole caravan. Uh, Goethe's also writing Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship around this time. Oh, sorry, he had written it maybe six years earlier, but it finally gets published. Resumes work on Faust, 1797. Then I think like there's a bit of a gap. England starts kind of properly getting involved in in the Romantic Revolution with 1798, Coleridge, yeah. and Wordsworth's lyrical ballads. And um, I, I, people kind of, how would you classify Goethe in terms of being like a romantic or uh, more kind of classical? He's pre-romantic, isn't he? Really? Yeah. I don't think he really liked the romantics. I think he may be like Byron. Yes. He's too big to be a romantic, almost. Um, he's too what big a figure. Like, yeah. So he, he's too big a figure, meaning like the bigger you get, the kind of broader you get. Now I know, okay, Byron is clearly romantic and he was very, very popular, but I just think that, you know, Goethe is the Shakespeare of Germany. Shakespeare is, is okay. He's a dramatist, but he's also, has the and so even as a, yeah. yeah, even as a dramatist, he's got, um, you know, the comedies, the histories, and obviously the tragedies yeah. and they're all they're all kind of their own thing so he can do comedy he can do tragedy because i was reading like i've read some of ben johnson for instance and that guy can basically just do comedy um mm-hmm. in terms of drama he can't do tragedy so i just think he's, he's too broad so he probably would have agreed with some of their viewpoints but they were so the romantics were so fixed um i'd say by the time Goethe dies in 1832 so by the time he was fading out, I think he would probably would have more liked the Wordsworth because Wordsworth was becoming um, kind of a better rounded individual by then, Coleridge as well. Whereas because he, right. he's a slightly older, I'd say he probably would have seen what he what he thought he's, from them was a lot of useful starts. idealism. Yeah. 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 All right, so that's basically it. When did Faust Part 1 come out? Because I think we're, we're ready to crack on. Test part one is published when? I think it's around 1800. Substantially finished 1801 and published 1808. There we go. And then, yeah, so there's a big gap then until 1832 when he does Test part two. Yeah, near his death. And you get Wilhelm Meister's Journeyman Years, which is like a sequel to Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship Years in 1821. Um. And oh, uh, poetry and truth, which is you know, is Dichtung and Wahrheit is also quite, quite a famous 
uh, mainly his autobiography, but I think he would probably shove a lot of maxims in there. That's like 1811. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we'll start with, and we kind of looked at this before, the ordering of these maxims are a bit odd, aren't they? Yeah, it's, uh, it's is it uh, it different um, different um, copies have it chrono chronologically or uh, by theme? Yeah, um, so we're, I'm, we're going off the Penguin Classics version, which does it by theme, or does it by you know they kind of they're all published at once, but kind of as a collection from stuff he'd say down the years, and sometimes through some of his characters and stuff as well. So it's not even his maxims necessarily all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and but, and it's important to note that it was uh, posthumously published. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like it really wasn't a set thing. I think it was just uh, the populace wanted more Goethe, but he was dead. So they kind of they found these maxims and tried to sort of summarize them in a neat little pocket yeah, book style cool. for people. Well, he was so uh, revered. It's kind of like... Uh, Johnson and uh, Boswell, where uh, yes. who, uh, who was Boswell the... mentioned? Boswell mentions in the... who was the collector in... of these? It was his editor, was it? Yeah, it was his editor, um, Eckerman or something. Eckerman. But uh, it was basically Bo a Boswell figure. Yeah. Boswell talks about how Johnson, uh, towards the the uh, the end, sort of burn all his uh, all his journals. Uh, so. I don't know what his what his motive there was, but yeah, I don't uh, know. I, he I, I believe he approved of, of, of he actually helped Boswell compose the uh, biography to a certain extent. So I wonder what what the relationship between uh, Eckerman, I believe it is, uh, and uh, yes, it is. Yeah, well, well, we'll crack into them, right? And I've yeah. started with number one, and I know you're not a fan of number one, or you think it's a bit odd, so I'll read it out. This is from the Elective Affinities, 1809, and this is from Otley's diary in the Elective Affinities. Uh, she was a daughter-in-law, was it? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Otley von Goethe, it's some sort of strange relation anyway. So I just, I'm, it's one that it starts with, but... Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how, like a lot of these, I, I see it coming through the character of Otley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, so she was daughter-in-law of Goethe. So number one, uh, we enjoy looking into the future because by our secret longings, we so much want to bring about a favorable realization of the vague possibilities that move to and fro in that realm. Mm. Uh, Underwhelming start for you? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know if I, I get much out of it. it doesn't uh, doesn't really yeah. catch my interest. Or so doesn't, uh, I, doesn't make me think too much. For me, it was like the reason I highlighted. It, I probably probably highlighted it because it was like the first one. And I was going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because by the time if, if you were on number nine hundred and forty eight, maybe it wouldn't have stood out. But I think. What it's trying to get at is the reason we like the future is because it can always contain the possibility you want in it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, more or less. And that's why man likes being quite forward looking. Um or a certain type of man, of course. <laughs> I'm quite backward looking, obviously, on my channel. I don't think I've had uh, everything is like pre uh, you need to look backward to uh, to plan the future. Yeah. So yeah, and you thought you thought the vague, them talking about vague possibilities in a realm was in a in and of itself a bit too vague for there to be anything taken from it. Yeah. Well, I found it to be kind of like a truism. Like, uh, I, I I I just kind of take the whole thing for granted. Yeah. Okay. Fair. So number two, then, it is not easy for us to be in the company of many people without thinking that chance having brought together so many, should also bring us our friends. This is kind of like the secret. You know that uh, kind of, uh, new age um, idea? No. And, uh, the secret is like a, quite a popular book that 
if you um, if you believe it enough, uh, it'll happen, kind of thing. That's true. Yeah, for me, this is very much Attili rather than you know Johan. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it says she's a socialite, you know, on the Wikipedia page of Attili von Goethe. Whereas, I mean, I mean, there is a truth in that, so uh, it's not like it's not wholly false. Or um, I think that it, it like you can, you can be skeptical about it, but I, I don't think you can flat out deny it. Yeah, but there's also a lot of meetings I think you have <laughs> in which you're like, I'm surrounded yeah. by people that I yeah. don't like her. Yeah, um, sure. I, I'm picturing. I think I know good. Maybe, 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 uh, maybe, maybe the fortunate. Yeah, I I just know Goethe, uh, when he was in Italy, uh, would would be invited, you know, to a lot of these dinner parties or whatever. And he always, uh, not always, but he, you know, he dreaded some of them because they'd kept they'd keep bringing up like, oh, and you went to Weimar and and and. You were known as this or known as that, and he never quite liked how they couldn't, would, um, could, couldn't escape him. his reputation. Yeah, yeah. typecast. Um, I remember him being uh, reading somewhere that he was frustrated at those parties. So I'm not sure if <laughs> he's just like, "Oh, chance brought us together. You must be my friend." It's like, no, you've uh, you've misread my character, <laughs> sort of thing. Uh, the next one I went for is five. Now, if I um, skip anyone that stood out for you. Though if you listened on audio, you probably don't have any uh, in front of you. Mark. But five, so to communicate is natural. To accept what is communicated is an acquired art. Yes, that's uh, that's kind of like a, an appreciation of, um, of what is being said, I suppose. Uh, um, like everyone, everyone in a conversation, everyone will often talk, talk uh, across each other, like past each other and uh to uh um, yeah i feel i feel to like truly uh, appreciate what what is beneath what is being said is uh i i, is I usually think like missed J jack dorsey should have read this before he created tri twitter <laughs> i feel why <laughs> well his, his whole view was like oh if everyone communicates on this great new platform you know it will not well, really flow that, that as is, a benefit yeah, to society kind of utopian yeah, but that, that's the whole the whole uh, the whole hope of the like internet in the early days is that utopian like the the freedom of information will inevitably yeah, but lead it's to greater education. But it's just like why did they think that? Because Goethe back here get, he like gets it just from experiencing ordinary life in seventeen nineties or whatever. You know, it would have seen mere communic yeah. like communication was natural to people so people were going to obviously thrive on something like twitter yeah. um, in terms of activity but <laughs> to accept what is communicated <laughs> like no yeah. one on twitter accepts what's communicated by anything other than their own profile so i think it, he has a quote about um dragging the good and the bad um with with it i think it's to do with um uh being empirical and focusing on a theory well, I'd say you could say the same with the technology yeah. focuses or drives both positive and neg negative uh, possibilities with it into the future. Tying it back to our first maxim: <laughs> <laughs> the vague possibilities of the future. Um, six. No one would talk much in company if he realized how often he himself misunderstands others. So linked. That's cut linked to the previous yeah. one. Yeah, no, I, I I very much agree with that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've often I wonder if I come across this sometimes. It's usually like if you change roles, um, like sometimes if you change roles in a job or something, uh, you you quickly realize how restricted like the previous lingo was or something you know what i mean um, yes that the these new teams suddenly just don't understand what you're talking about even things you thought were broader than yeah your old it, role actually yeah, there's a particular really uh, a, a, a particular lingo and the, yeah way of doing things yeah I, it has certainly come to me at certain times in my life where you just realize that on a 
Oof. Everything going all right there? Yeah, yeah. My, my uh, band is just turning up uh, in the kitchen. All right. So we'll go on to eight. Uh, anyone who holds forth at length and without flattering his listeners will court dislike. Anyone who holds forth at length and without flattering. I think this is kind of like know your audience yeah. and, and flatter them the odd time. Yeah. Yeah. This 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 reminds me a bit like a sort of Machiavellian advice <laughs> that he would give yeah. to a prince. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's almost like the uh, people can't face the truth or uh, the necessity of uh, kind of uh, appealing to uh, people as opposed to um, being very frank. People don't like necessarily. Yeah, it's like kind of like uh, feelings don't like your facts, sort of thing. People, yeah, uh, feelings people. don't care about your facts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, here's 10 then. Contradiction and flattery both make for poor conversation. So he's just told you to flatter people or else you'll be disliked. And yeah, well, I think, I think that's more of a crit. I, I think number eight is more of a criticism of uh, the frivolity of society. And, uh, and he's saying, he's saying it on, a, on, a, on, a, on, an on an individual level. You know what I mean? He's, he's saying to the individual that uh, do not suffer fools. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then and number eight is almost like, oh, you, you have to suffer fools to, uh, to be liked. Yeah. So, so hence why, uh, <laughs> yeah, d d democracy in the in the age of like mass information is turning into something even beyond, you know, what we saw in terms of twentieth century passion passionry. It's like it's 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 t it's up the ante even more in that regard. Yeah, well, it's kind of uh, on both sides. It's a it's kind of low information voting and. Um, yeah, which is which is really strange in the age of the internet that like it, it, it's kind of yeah. like everyone's just waiting for a soundbite rather than. Well, I, f I feel like the internet reading. allows allows things to be um, it, like like say uh, newsprint created a kind of a hierarchy of information, but, and then television there maybe a a broader hierarchy because there were probably less less people uh, reading. Um, news like or maybe maybe it's the technology itself doesn't require the same sort of effort um, but I suppose the, the internet in its own way is is, is more total and uh, is a larger hierarchy of, uh, of information yeah and I troll, wonder in Goethe's, the in, in Goethe's own lifetime how much Carlyle talks a lot about the paper age in 1780s France and the effect it had before the revolution, like this pamphleteering then created this, what he calls the blabbering class. You know, there's the, mm -hmm. it, it, in the enlightenment, there was two parts of it. There was the the pamphleteer with the pen and then that would be like your, your central node. And then he would set all the blabberers of the blabbering class, uh, uh free basically with his it's, own, it, well own things stuff. haven't really changed have, have they no i think carlisle calls respect. that quite well um yeah. this sort of i feel, I feel like i feel like the whole the same the same system almost has maintained itself through all the technological changes yeah here. so so goethe would have again been would have been able to tell jack dorsey some sense uh, number 12, the clearest indication of character is what people find laughable. Hmm. What do you make of that? I don't, I, I think he's trying to yeah, find something kind of interesting, but I don't believe it. I think it, because it's easier, I think ultimately it's easier to laugh at some at aspects of people's characters than to find something yeah, i feel like it, people often, often la laugh at things that they like something odd that they wouldn't necessarily understand 
maybe that would that's a unique trait or something that they would not really be able to they not necessarily come across before and just laugh uh yeah i think it's more an indication of characters like how how much they they can bring inspiration to other people as well like that's for me is a is a clearer indication of character than <laughs> something somebody finds laughable because i think you can even have somebody who inspires people a lot and can get kind of get a good team going rallying behind them who can still have an element in them that you know inspires i don't know they can have weird eccentricities to their character that that you could consider laughable but it's not their clearest indication the clearest indication is still their ability to galvanize and orchestrate. Yeah, I wonder if he's saying it like in a in a frivolous way. Uh, so that's something. Um, I'm not really sure what he's getting at. Yeah, it's kind of well, it's kind of like if if someone makes a gaffe on a. Yeah. Say you're say you've done a 90 minute speech and there's 89 minutes of tremendous policy outlined there, and then you've made this horrendous gaffe at some point. What's going to get remembered? the gaff yeah right so maybe maybe he's talking about that 14 sensuous man often laughs where there is nothing to laugh at whatever stimulates him his inner contentment shows itself mm. i feel like uh mad men are people who are deeply neurotic also also laugh <laughs> at nothing so. the joker <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, sure, sure. I, I do. I do think like if there's an inner monologue, uh, people uh, you could come across a thought that uh, that's, that makes you laugh, and you just be by yourself. So yeah, that is true. Yeah. yeah, I think it's sometimes you do find yourself laughing at something just very um, mundane. Yeah, but, like, but it's you just find, like really you easy find, comedy, but you'll still find yeah. yourself laughing at it. No, but I'm talking about say like in. Uh, you're completely like you say you're walking down the street you're by yourself and something humorous pops into your mind and you laugh there's a kind of uh immediate yeah. uh, awareness that you are um uh, laughing in your own head i don't know it is how, and how would you compare that to like say you're listening to a podcast and something funny happened and you, you're getting well at least at least uh, you, know, like, you you're taking like other uh, other people yeah you can pass it off directly you can pass Directly it off easier, can't you? Acting. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's, Whereas when it's, it's just, just completely self, internal. A self self stimulation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no self stimulation in public, please. Yes. That's why that's why I think people don't like it, to be honest. Yeah. It's kind of unnerving <laughs> when somebody just like say you're working or whatever and so in the cubicle next to you, somebody just bursts out bursts out laughing. Um, well, like I'd immediately silence. assume they're watching something no, funny. No or, earphones, no nothing. They're looking, yeah. they're looking at their... Uh, they're kind of like, okay, their, what email did you fingers. get? Or like, what? You yeah. must have What's so funny? Everyone, they, it, 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 like the, the question everyone asks someone who laughs like that is, oh, what's so funny? Because they really want to know what, like, what the hell's going on, you know? Mm. Uh, 15, the man who understands <laughs> finds almost everything laughable. The man of reason, practically nothing. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is kind of like uh, almost like Oscar Wilde. Um, there's a kind of I feel like that whole um, everything's a joke kind of. Um, it's there's something a little bit uh, frivolous about it. Oh, what what do you what's your opinion on Wilde generally? Oh, I think, uh, no, I, I like Wilde. They're very witty and everything, but I think there are um, there are areas of uh, of life and his own life or whatever that, uh, that he certainly wasn't laughing at. And, no. Uh, and like there's... <laughs> there's, there's, there's now, so, <laughs> no, 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 no. But there's, there's, uh, there's somber. There's a, like, there's a tragic element to life as well. And just, just the whole, la like, the whole frivolous uh, thing. Um, it, 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 it doesn't uh, face uh, it's a lot of the, like earn, like a true earnest uh, appreciation of, of, of 
of things is is also important. Uh, yeah, I th I'm just uh, reading it again. In, in, lit in literature uh, as well, like, you can't just like be uh, reading something ironic. It's nauseating if you if you if you're only uh, exposed to that. Yeah, I'm just going through it again. So the man who understands finds almost everything laughable. The man of reason, practically nothing. And I am seeing in sort of internet culture age, an overlap of you know, there's this meme of you got the clown world meme. And you've also got this like high IQ meme, so it's kind of like I don't know. Who... I don't know the, the high IQ one. Well, that's just, that's just like um, you make a certain argument, and it can be high IQ or low IQ sort of thing. Um, uh, but ba usually there's an overlap between people who you know consider themselves in the high IQ argument style, who would also find uh, the you know the world becoming more and more like clown world. So. Uh -huh that's kind of they will see themselves as people who understand and are hence finding everything laughable yeah have you ever read uh rilke's letters to a young poet no i've only read snippets of the duino elegies of rilke yeah well, he uh he's counseling this uh guy this young man in a series of letters he kind of goes into the whole um says something like uh, irony there, there are um there are uh, areas of life where our irony uh, stands blankly and, and uh, has nothing to say. Uh, that's kind of what I was kind of talking about. Uh, yeah. Okay. 18. Uh, certain shortcomings are necessary for an individual's existence. We would feel uncomfortable if old friends were to discard certain characteristics. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's kind of a uh, everyone is unique uh, and shaped by their uh, their uh, limitations, imperfectibilities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like man's a fallen creature. So, like in but in the uh, individualism is almost defined by the aspects of the fall, <laughs> like mm -hmm. to, the avenues yeah. in which you are yeah. fallen. It's lim limitation uh, is also definition. Kind of thing. Yeah. They help draw, like you know, you can't, you can't, you, you, you can't quantify something that's um, that's um, like limitless or has uh, has no uh, no bounds. Um, Nineteen. Quote: He'll soon die, as the saying goes, when someone acts out of character. It's again mm. similar to eighteen. That well, you, you know you start you to dislike someone when they behave differently. Yeah. And his yeah. he'll soon die is kind of like your mind of who that person is is how you've seen them behave. Yeah. So like that person is defined by their behave how they have behaved in front of you. Yeah. In past experience. So if they start behaving differently, that's hence like he'll soon die. Because the, the your internal like acceptance of who they are is no longer there. Yeah. The flaying of Marcus or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. See his um, like hubris or or maybe yeah. Oh no, I know what you're getting at. That uh, the uh, the friend or whatever has a set idea of who you are. And uh, if if you uh, change um, and they keep their idea, it makes them uncomfortable. So we'll go. We'll go to twenty. Uh, what kind of shortcomings are we allowed to keep, indeed cultivate in ourselves, the kind that flatter rather than hurt other people? So again, he's linking back to flattery. Um, we're allowed to keep the shortcomings that end up flattering other people. So it's kind of linked to that idea that people like flattery. So even if it's a shortcoming that has led to you flattering them, they'll accept that. Yeah. Not sure yeah, if you get sure. anything else from that. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not sure where to, where to begin with that one. Okay, we'll go on. 21, passions are faults or virtues, only heightened ones. Yeah. 
that's um kind of showing him to the amount of his his time like uh, passions if in an earlier era would have been seen as uh, wholly bad yeah like, in, in the kind of stultified pre-french revolution yeah. uh, in the christian know, uh, great baroque yeah yeah um uh there's some something about uh I'm not sure where it comes from. All passions lead to death, or something like that. Uh, so I don't think he would have had that that view. Well, is it necessarily wrong? It's kind of like it's kind of like um, you know, if you burn, he who burns brightest. Yeah, would extinguish himself earlier. You know. Yeah. I'm sort of linking the uh, the. The burning bright with the passion there but you know what i mean yeah, yeah. no i understand uh, our passions number 22 our passions are uh, genuine phoenix as the old one burns down the new one immediately arises out of the ashes i, I believe that's that that's very true that um you know you can't really stay still with uh, like when uh, when something goes stale there's it's always always a uh, new uh, drive uh, yeah I, well yeah traction. I think that's really key um, I often find that like I would work at something and yeah I don't know after a while it, it can go stale but um, there's always this other thing that, that you're trying to fulfill um, even if even if it, then it becomes stale again the mind can cast itself to new avenues where you're like, well, I really didn't get to grips with this topic or that topic in life. Um, so now that this one's gone stale, I'll just move into the the other one. It's got scope for growth sort of thing. So it's, yeah, it's kind of like finding the, uh, the search for yield, you know, in like economic terms, everyone wants to search for yield. It's kind of like you're searching for yield again. Um, and then once that dries up, becomes stale, you begin searching for yield in like, in like your own fulfillment. Okay. The next one I've highlighted is 27. I don't know if you have any more before that. Um, no, I don't. I don't have anything highlighted. So 27, we don't get to know people when they come to us. We have to go to them to discover how things stand. Right. Um. That's kind of. I'm not sure I agree with that. Why did you highlight? I don't know. I think I highlighted like 18 months ago. Um, <laughs> sometimes I highlight highlight them though, not because I agree with them, but because they provoke thought. Um, right. And it kind of does to me. It's because you think, well, hang on, that sounds good. Like you have to go to someone you have to seek something out in order to get to know it better and i think that's true yeah, it's almost like skills. turning 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 the focus onto an object right yeah you, i uh, think it's true in you're skills. not focusing right okay go on well, i think it's true in skills and that like if you want to you learn by doing um if you're trying to do anything like like for instance i think i think we're getting to know Goethe's maxims a lot more by actually doing this practice than had having just read them or having just listened to them. You, um, it's a, a greater, a deeper engagement. Kind of. Yeah, but I don't think that's true for people. Like, because the, cause the person, you can only go to an object, so, uh, or, you know, go dive into the skill. Uh, it, it can never come to you. So obviously you get to learn things better by diving into them. But I think if someone comes to you, that really does reveal a lot about their character that they even trust to come to you with whatever it is so I, that's why i just think he's wrong there yeah yeah it's hard to know sometimes with these quotes uh, what exactly what level oh yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. is he he's also could be operating through a lens it's here. just Again, one it's sentence so, diaries it, yeah. yeah it doesn't always like fit fit in into place the next one i had was 39 Okay. Uh, behavior is a mirror in which everyone shows his image. 
Yeah, no, I, I largely uh, largely agree with that. Yeah, um, I just thought I thought it was a nice little. By the fruits you shall know them. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can think something, um, but yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like that idea of stated against revealed preference. You know, behavior is the revealed preference of your internal um, yeah. beliefs, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Uh, uh, that, that would be probably my favorite one to. Uh... Yeah, that's like in terms of if you're going to take out any to learn. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It is the, yeah, the most didactic. Behavior is a mirror in which everyone shows his image. Yeah, you could just. Yeah, it is a good one actually. Um, yeah, maybe maybe that's also a good idea. Like we we maintain this. And again, you know, that the, that wouldn't be. A, yeah, that wouldn't be something uh, a Christian or certainly a Catholic would have said. Uh, judge not by that's their, true. By, I by think. I, yeah, he's. To try and pin down Goethe's religion, I think, is is quite difficult. He's certainly, yeah, he's certainly a man of his time, a leading man of his time. So he's not, uh, he's not constrained by previous uh, modes of thinking. Forty three. No one is more a slave than the one who thinks he is free, without being free. Yes. Yeah. We can't. I think we mentioned this one before in conversation. It's, it's, I think it's really accurate because it's kind of like Plato's cave, right? Um, if you, if you think you're free already, you, you can't see the boundaries to actually yeah. begin to break free. It's like a, uh, right? it's almost like a, a stallion or a, a horse. Um, dom a domesticated horse. Uh, uh, the one doesn't necessarily need uh, a fence, the same degree as the other are, to be uh, to be um, bridled as heavily when the rider is riding the horse. Um, you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> the, uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, what would you What would you think of that in relation to the year twenty twenty? <laughs> and uh, people have been talking about like curtailments of civil liberties and stuff. Say in a pand so you're in a pandemic. Um, what What should well, this is a, this is the thing. Uh, I think it was Aldous Huxley wrote of uh, it. Really does tie into Aldous Huxley, and um, you can uh, you can teach. Teach a uh, you can teach a horse to um, to yield through the whip or through uh, sugar, like a sugar cube. Yes, <laughs> I think you can teach and, man through uh, sugar. No one is yeah. yeah. No one is more slave than one who thinks he's free. Is is there's no need to use the whip. Yeah, I think that's what you're seeing a lot in um, post industrialization. That a lot of people have, have these frustrations, but it's constantly curtailed or like limited in its own scope um because of the abundance paradox you know you shouldn't be so frustrated if you're materially satisfied so to speak yeah um you can kind of link it with like obesity now because you know is obesity yeah is no immediately that class. was that was that is the central image that that was the first thing that came to mind was, uh, was yeah Obesity and um, I suppose uh, the way culture has become um, a product as opposed to something uh, created by um, individuals and uh, communities. It's something that's consumed. So we'll go on to 44. Uh, a person has only to say he is free and he immediately feels constrained. If he has the courage to say he is constrained, then he feels free. Hmm. It's it's just, it's a it's a paradox, uh, a catch twenty two. Um, if you he's yeah. setting a, like, what's that he's, again, the he's setting symbol. a limit on himself. Yeah, which which is that? What's that the Asian, Asian symbol? symbol? It's like is it called the Dao or something? Oh, the Dao. Um, 
<laughs> I have to look it up. Are you talking about it's like, kind of like a play on a robber, like 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 something eating its own tail? Oh yeah, yeah, the yin yang thing, right? The, uh... Yeah, I, yeah, I can't remember what it's called. My my knowledge so, of it, uh, uh, Asian. That's a friend, a friend, Dylan. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> my knowledge of Asian culture is not like I'm, I'm a European man. Um, yeah, but okay, it's kind of like this paradox. It's, it's kind of like this. so. He, I think we was trying to get to here as well as like you know, you, if you think you're free, you, you're no more. You're more slave than anyone else. It's kind of like that paradox. There is a freedom paradox in life, um, and so it's, he's just kind of he's thinking up new ways. Yeah, it's also facing uh, like like the, so the person the first sentence the fr- person who who has only to say he is free and he feels immediately constrained if he has the courage to say he is constrained like it's facing uh, uh, facing the reality of of a situation it needs to be constantly renewed. Uh, um, one of the things about feeling constrained. And then that being free is sometimes I feel like if you ever need to start like a workload or something, um, yeah. or you have you have possibilities to choose something. Constraint will actually either like it'll initiate or order your workload. Say your workload is constrained by you could, you could have a time constraint or you could have certain, you know, certain other constraints. Uh, maybe it depends what tools you have, blah blah blah. But it can actually set you working, and the constraint will begin a process. Yeah. Uh, similarly, if you have a choice in a shop of something, a constraint will allow you to choose and then move on in in your sort of life. So the constraints can be bring like I wouldn't say they bring. Oh, I I know what you're getting. Freedom, yeah. but like yeah, they can be a good. Yeah, and also kind of yeah. Except, again, it goes back to the previous one of accepting uh, limitations. Not only in your own personal abilities, but in uh, in uh, the uh, in the the constraints of your life. So I'll go. I've got forty six. There is something horrifying about a man of outstanding excellence, of whom stupid people are proud. <laughs> you know what comes to what mind? Do you think? Of, who, who? No, not someone in particular, but just. Uh. When someone has this, uh, you, I, don't think, I think you get it less in the Spotify and uh, Apple Music age, but you know, we used to have this band that you had discovered. Yeah. And then when everyone discovers them, you're kind of like, uh, yeah, they're not that great anymore. Oh, yeah. And I because think that's a phenomenon. It's everyone, like a, lo- kind of a, loss like of, a loss of ownership or uh, of uh, yeah, being able to kind of individually like... separate yourself from the, the rest. Yeah, well, that's that's definitely twinned with that feeling, but I think also twinned with that feeling is what he what what Goethe is getting at here, and it's kind of like, well, I think I consider those people stupid, and now it's, they it's, admire. It's this quite thing, a missing, and that makes me it's quite a, my, my own admiration. Right. Yeah, it's quite a misanthropic thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you, I don't know. Do you have anything else on it? Like, what does it make you think no. of? Does it make you think of a certain individual or anything like that? I was uh, I was wondering if if you had uh, someone in, in if mind, I had an individual. Not, yeah. I don't know. Sometimes if I think I have an excellent, uh, you know, consider someone excellent, and then uh, other people start liking, it, I think it's a bit different. I can usually I, sometimes I usually feel vindicated because <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I told you that beforehand. Yeah. I don't know. I can't. I can't. Think I, of I, I, I would. I would. I would. So I, so I wouldn't necessarily. It would be more for me is I would find it irritating or horrifying if, and I do find it horrifying when there's someone who I don't believe is some a person of ability who is then lauded by people who I don't yeah. necessarily respect. But uh, but yeah, this, that, that, that is obviously way worse. <laughs> yeah, but this this I'm not sure I've, I've ever come across that myself no. personally. Um, I can. You know what? I actually I can. Um, where I can imagine it is like in really competitive, uh, also very exclusive academic circles. 
someone like right. you liked some well, you know that, uh, journal by somebody. Has that Michelle, Michelle Welbeck book or I can't remember the name. I haven't read it either. But uh, it's basically it's about submission. The, no, no, no. It's uh, it's one about um, you know the Canadian pianist Glenn Gould. Uh, a, oh yeah, famous yes, yes, for his his back fuse. The, the Bach, yeah. I, yeah, and uh, he uh, in in the novel there's this uh, aspiring Parisian, I believe he's Parisian <laughs> pianist, and he then comes across Glenn Gould who. Uh, who just ba- basically destroys his life because he knows he can never be as good as him kind of thing. And he's just like filled with uh, like the most uh, potent envy imaginable. That's that like the, remind, uh, the, the plot. reminds me of Caesar breaking down in tears when he reads about Alexander and what he accomplished at like, what was it, 32 or something when Caesar was in right. his thirties. Oh, really? Um, yeah. yeah and, and, uh, and he had a full head of hair too. Well, you know, classic literature is is littered with this sort of like uh, almost very very emotional experience. I think it all you can bring it all the way back to like the fact Achilles is quite emotional. You know, we've seen as the archetypal hero, and he's quite an emotional character himself. Um, so, like a lot of those rulers, you know, the great men of antiquity can be quite emotional at times. Um, Forty nine, the greatest people are always linked with their with their century through some weakness. I think you said something about this before. Yeah, I think I, I think I'd call it out before, just as an example. When we when we talked about possibly doing this, I, I yeah. mentioned it as an example of a maxim. But reading it more in context with having read out other ones about where he's talking about weakness of character, for me, it, it takes on a different mold. Because I think before I was trying to, uh, maybe it is like weakness creates constraint. Well, which kind, of, kind of was, can of a zeitgeist, I thought you were getting at a uh, previous. Um, like the greatest people are always linked. Like so, you could say. Um, I'm trying to think of an example now. Um, yeah, that, that there's a particular zeitgeist uh, that that limits a whole age, but is almost defined by that uh, particular individual. Uh, trying to think of it. Do you have an example? <laughs> <laughs> I do not. I, I did have a point on this there. before, but I can't really yeah. remember what it is. This, this right is not what I think it was. Yeah. Not sure. Right now, I'm thinking it's he's kind of just expanding the idea of limitations and constraints. So lim- limitations are defining characters. And so if you widen that out, like the weakness of an age um, links the greatest people, you know, with that century. Right. Um, well, you could say you could say uh, you could almost look at like um, say painting or whatever, and um, each each uh, epoch has like so like Rococo and then cla- uh, neoclassicism and uh, all that. It like uh, it's taken to its extreme, and uh, it kind of falls away. And yeah, I. I think also what what he can get at here is like he's trying to be trite by thinking of things the way other people won't think of things. But if you're if you try and define the if you try and define the greatness of somebody um, as being linked through the absence of an age or something, it's kind of like looking at something because of what's missing. So. You know, in like in like a, a sort of semiconductor theory, where you can have what are basically considered positive particles, um, you know, effectively a positive particle because they're actually uh, an electron-shaped hole in a material. If you know what I mean, you uh, uh, you then can, kind of. you can switch it on its head and pretend it's just like as if it's a, po- a positive uh, particle moving around. So it's kind of like looking at that. He's switching it on its head. And then looking at the weakness or the absence, and then you from that you can define uh, what's really going on. Yeah, I, I never got as far with the physics as you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fifty-three. Even at the moment of highest bliss and highest distress, we need the artist. Yeah. Do you, how much him, do you think there he's what? thinking about himself? <laughs> 
hundred <laughs> percent. Because I don't know. Is he thinking about himself needing another artist? Like, does he consider 100%. himself always needing another artist, or is he kind of being like, at the moment of highest bliss, or <laughs> um, or what is it? A distress. You need me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, to be honest, I think he's uh, kind of um, lionizing what it means to be an artist, but I, I, I don't think it's, uh, I, Wallace Stevens said that uh, art was uh, one of the, uh, one of the enlargements of life. And I don't think it's, uh, he said it was, I would agree with him and I would say it's, it's not the only means of enlarging life. And, uh, he's correct yeah. that it, it's, it's, I don't think it's, an, it, it's a necessity, but it's certainly route to uh, to you know a deeper experience so, so that would put that would put goethe against that sort of platonic idea as defined by his theory of forms plato's theory of forms where art is degenerative from the idea right yeah. whereas art, wasn't it wasn't at aristotle believes that art art lifts you up from from the everyday world whereas in in like the strict reading of Plato's theory of forms, I think it's like a removal. It's another tier removed from the pure idea. Right. Yeah. No, I understand. But but Goethe is thinking it lifts you up similarly to Wallace Stevens, as you quoted. Yeah. Um. So then the last one I had from Elective Affinities was fifty six, and I said difficulties increase the nearer we get to the goal. Yeah, that's kind of like the. Um... Yeah, the, 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 like say chess, like you start out as a beginner, you think it's a relatively um, straightforward game and you, you could play, play yeah, yeah, you could play with, uh, with another beginner and, and uh, think you know uh, a lot about chess, but then it's, it's just infinitely complex. And uh, the more you, you, uh, the more effort you put in the, uh, the more you realize how little you know until you gradually begin to learn more and more aspects of it. Um, yeah, it's like mastery. That's the kind of the curve it takes, like starts up with a big steep uh, level of confidence and then a, a, an even steeper decline followed by a kind of a gradual growth. So that's that's all of them from elective affinities and we'll be going for an hour now. I don't know if you want to break it up and then we can go back. Like we've got, uh, the next one is from art and antiquity, uh, which is yeah. a, a sort of collection. Of yeah, we should, we should break it up. We should, That's a good moment to break, it. do you reckon? I reckon so. Cool. Okay. So we'll call it that then. Let me just end the broadcast.